Hey everybody, this is Jeff Peterson, and this is the Interstate of Music podcast. And with me today is a couple guys from Pearl Drums. Glenn Kruba, he is the Vice President of Sales and Marketing, and a personal friend of mine, Mark Tarek. He's a, a senior sales manager for Pearl Drums as well. <laughs> Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. Glad yeah. to be here. Mark, thanks, say something. Say, yeah, th yeah th thanks. Thank Appreciate you, Jeff. It. You want to hear my radio voice. Thank yeah, you, br Jeff. Bring the noise, Mark. You've got that. You've got the chops for that. <laughs> so so a little bit, uh, I want to kind of find out a little bit about you guys uh, on the personal side of life. And uh, I guess I'll start by with you, Glenn. So where where are you from originally? I know you're you're living in Nashville right now, um, doing that whole thing, because that's, uh, that's where Pearl's office is, right? Yep. Our headquarters is here in Nashville, Tennessee. We have a, a, a satellite warehouse in Pennsylvania or just outside of uh, Chambersburg, PA. And yeah, so, uh, but everything that you see, Pearl, is coming out of our HQ here in Nashville, Tennessee. Love that. Where are you from personally? I mean, you haven't been in Nashville. Miami, Florida. Life, have you? Yeah. Miami. I, I grew up in Miami. Yeah. So all my schooling was there. My, my first entrance into, uh, Retail was at a small drum shop called Resurrection Drums while I was at Florida International University in Miami and uh, started to, you know, catch on to the business side of it uh, at an early age and and then juggling the two uh, from from a, a performance side and a business side ever since. So since the late so, 80s. So when you went to when you went to college, you know, you hear, you know, a lot of musicians, they're like. I, I wanted to be in the music industry. I took some coursework. I wanted. I thought maybe I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to do this. What were you going to school for? As far as like, what did you think you wanted to be? Was it always a drummer, or like, what was it? Yeah. Uh, so music performance uh, um, is is where I started, and I ended up uh, with music education. Um, I was performing with a lot of my professors at the time, and I'm going. Well, we're making the same bank here, working the local scene, and. You're teaching me at school, so maybe I need to fall back on a, on an education degree. And uh, my both my parents, my mom and dad, um, were teachers as well. So uh, it just kind of felt like the natural suit to go that direction. Um, but uh, it, it was soon apparent to me that I, I wanted to stay uh, playing as much as possible. And that drove me up to Nashville um, in 1993. So that's when I moved up here. And, and on the education trail, did you think you were going to be teaching – you know, younger kids, like grade school kids, high school, college, like at what level did you think you were going to fit in? And was that totally because your parents were kind of in that world and you just looked at it as like, hey, I like summers off and I want to play the drums. Yeah. <laughs> the summers off thing was nice. It, it, I don't know if it was really uh, that decisive um, of a decision at the time. I just realized that from performing um, it, a degree wasn't a necessity to have to right. to make it as a performer so you know and it wasn't I, I wasn't really getting a lot of like uh pressure so to speak from my parents but um i just felt if i was going to have anything to fall back on um maybe an education degree was was the way to go um but that's just pretty much how i like how it, it ended up there was no real grand plan as far as i'm concerned you know i, I sit there and i talk to a lot of college students nowadays i'm not sure uh uh, things have changed as far as the uh, grand plans of uh, of what they think they're going to be or what what they're going to school for. I think everybody's kind of still in that same mindset, just trying to get through it. So, that Mark, how did right. How, right? No, in fact, it makes me want to go back to college. Uh, so, so Mark, how about you? Where are you where are you from originally? Uh, born and raised right there in your Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where you're sitting. That's awesome. So, <laughs> so. When you were when you were uh, growing up in Wisconsin, I mean, I don't want to say that there's that it Milwaukee's not the best city in the country for music because it's okay. I think that's about as far as I you think go with it. Jeff, I I I would have to disagree with you. I think good it's a good. That's what I like. I, I like I, when people disagree with me. And I always <laughs> I always thought from a young kid even to now I think Milwaukee has always been a little hidden secret. It's kind of a cool little it city. It is a hidden you know, it is a hidden secret. <laughs> and there and there has been some really cool musicians and if you are connected, you know, if you get into the music scene in Milwaukee, right. uh, playing or in the music business or anything and you start getting into that stream, there's a lot of lineage of pretty good musicians and players and bands that come out of this region. So I, I totally 
So I totally agree with that. It's it's just I always wanted to see more out of Milwaukee as far as the locations for original music to be played. That's more where I'm kind of going with it. Like tons of fantastic musicians are from the Mm -hmm. state of Wisconsin and bands that have made it and all that. It's just, I've always kind of struggled with like the number of venues that have been around for, for as close to Chicago and Minneapolis and kind of that thoroughfare. I always thought there should be more focus on some of the venues that would come out of it. And I always wanted more out of Milwaukee in that way. There's some cool venues that are out there, but just, just not enough. I want to see more. A lot of cover bands, yeah. a lot of cover bands packing. The I dance. agree, you know, and then we, you know, obviously we were put on the map. I don't know when the heck that started back when I was man, pretty young. I remember the first summer fest I hit and that festival, you know, really brings a lot of local talent out and national talent into this, yeah. into this town. And that is, that, just that is kind of the stamp of where Milwaukee has kind of made it their own yeah. and, and uh, kind of. Let I mean the first the first summer fest and you know because you're I think you and I are right I'm in that same fi- I'll be 54 in December <laughs> well so, see yeah. I'm way ahead of you so that's why I guess that's why I got the senior senior <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome At I'm some hitting point, the 60. I'm have to add senior to mine I get the arp yeah, I'm, the I'm hitting the big helps. 60 but I remember the first summer fest I got to um yeah it was on the north end of the grounds there you know there was a small grounds down on the lakefront yep. and there was a snow fence and a stage and Santana was playing you know on like Thursday night and just going down there when I was a teenager and standing Keeping it classy beaches. with that snow fence Woo! <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome <laughs> Pretty fun stuff So what when did you start kind of saying i'm a drummer mark i mean it, like at my what father stage my, life? yeah my entire life my father played drums my bro my older brother which co- he could have been my father he was about 15 16 years older than i am um he was a drummer so i had drums laying around the house my entire life so i you know before i knew it i was just going downstairs and putzing around and playing and and that whole thing. So I started playing just, you know, by myself when I was a little, little kid. And it's, and you guys know this and Glenn going through the educational side of, of, of music. Do you find drums more difficult? Like, do you think somebody's kind of built to be a drummer or do you think you can take somebody that is, uh, you know, not a musician or a trumpet player and teach them how to play drums. Is it more difficult of an instrument, you think, to kind of catch on because you're doing so many different things with so many different, you know, how different is it to be a percussionist versus, you know, another instrument? The the phys- physically speaking, there's a lot of differences, obviously. Yeah. Uh, the the teaching part of it, um, I have not really seen any real big barriers for me to you know, translate a message to a non-drummer, whether it's a musician or, you know, just a, a, a hobbyist um, to gravitate towards it. There's some basics that, that you know, I could tell pretty much right away if you got it or you don't. But even if you don't have it, you know, we all have a heartbeat. You got a, you got a BPM that should have a metronome inside if you're, if you're alive. And yep. we start with that and uh, go from there. But yeah, I think it's, it's intimidating for a lot of people that do not understand um, all of the independence that you have to have between your, your limbs and what your brain has to process. Uh, but if you start at the basics, I, I haven't really had any sort of uh, obstacles that uh, prevented me from you know, sending my message to somebody else of how to start at least. So, so you know, for everybody Jeff, out there, everybody out there that's not a drummer yet and you always wanted to be, give it a shot, right? Yeah, I, 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 I pride myself saying I can get you to play a basic rock beat in 60 seconds. Yeah. And, 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 and you can have Glenn, fun with it. Teach and, me yeah. those drums. <laughs> <laughs> I could I could do it in about 60 seconds. Get you a basic, you know, and, and with very simplistic you know, nomenclature and not really getting into um, reading Love music that. at that point, but just just basics of here, put your hands here and I'm going to almost Simon says you a little bit as far as what to hit and when to hit it and then get you going onto a basic beat. Just give me a minute and I can get you started. And, honestly, and you know, Jeff, yeah, go ahead, Mark. Kicking it, kicking in with this with this subject. Glenn is exactly right. You can become a basic drummer and have fun in your basement right. and play along with records and just do, you know, enjoy the heck out of it. But as we know, as you know, and that that that's what you said, like, do you think somebody has it? 
Yeah. Well, the, sometimes the difference between the has it, it's not really all the notes they're playing and the speed they're playing at. We as drummers, we sometimes we just hear some of these guys that play a simple two four, you know, like Glenn was saying, two four <laughs> rock beat and laying it into the music. And there's something inherent in certain guys that I I can listen to that all day long, but I can't copy it. And it's yeah. I'm not I'm not really copying anything heavy. It's Phil Rudd, ACDC. There's yeah. one right there. You can't <laughs> get more basic of a job. But you, yeah, you listen to Phil play a beat with ACDC, and you're just going, man, does that feel so good? And it's the simplest beats ever, but no one can make it feel as good as Phil Rudd from ACDC. Every drummer I've ever met, and I, you know, I used to manage bands. I used to have a, a, a bar that had live music and the whole thing, and and you'd look at the struggle of the drummers that are coming in, hauling their gear in. They're always the one that's there earlier, always the one that's there later, always the one that is having all the time to set up, always the one that somebody's coming up and saying, could you play a little softer? We're a smaller venue. You're too loud. The, the drummer deals with so much crap from, from everything else. But you're all, you also, when you get a chance to actually talk to a drummer, I don't know that there's a musician in the world that is having more fun than the drummer. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Everyone is just like, I love it, man. I, I don't, it's, I just love it. You know, with the years, the years that Glenn and I have in the industry and playing, that is, we, we kind of find it in being in the drum end of things. We always talk about drummers, you know, we all, they, they, we have cl clinicians and they do, you know, events for us and things yeah. like that. You can go to a, a guitar, a bass clinic and those guys, uh, they're technical and they're secret. They're very secret. And, you know, they're kind of <laughs> yeah. drummers are just like laughing, having fun, telling you everything you want to know right out front. Right. You know, just just enjoying enjoying the instrument and having fun. And that's kind of the vibe with the whole drum scene. You know, it really is and that next to next to like a really uh, you know you know passionate lead guitarist or or, or vocalist <laughs> that, that you can see are really into their instrument drummers seem to have that uh expression on their instrument where eyes are immediately drawn to the drummer i mean I, we yeah. were just talking before we went on air and I, uh, I went to a rival sons concert at the ryman auditorium and band sounded fantastic and everybody had literally spotlights on them but you could tell all eyes were front and center on the lead vocalist and the drummer and the, and uh yeah um mike miley on drums was just he, he was killing it just again a fantastic player but drummers they, they get the attention so you put up with all the crap <laughs> you yeah, know right the the, the the 20 rules of uh, everything that you mentioned there jeff as far as you know play playing too loud and can you have a more simple rig and all these different little you yeah, know got downsize such, you know? do you really oh, need yeah, all those downsize you know all the load in the load out all and all that stuff but at the end of the day when you're on stage i think it's worth it and and i what i what i love about you know just the drummers i it's kind of cool because there's so many different ways you can I, I i'll use it in a in a kind of fashion to accessorize your sound with with some of the different uh you know kits that you know whether it's cymbals whether it's you know a, a simple cowbell or you know whatever sure. it is you might want to be you know adding to it 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 really is one of those things where you can really personalize a song a different way just because you brought some singular accessories where if you're playing guitar yeah you're going to play different notes all that kind of stuff but you can have a completely different sound that jumps into a song because of something you're hitting or the way you're hitting it when you're the drummer i mean and that and that is what can become the most memorable part of a song a show a concert whatever it is that one moment of time and you've got that one accessory that does that one thing to kind of impact people which is i think it's so cool uh i couldn't agree with you more uh, you know we we uh had a marketing campaign a decade plus ago called uh weapons of mass percussion <laughs> and it was a way of of accessorizing your drum set with all these cool uh you know under 100 dollars uh, little, whether it's cowbells, blocks, tambourines, wind right. chimes, uh, you know, you name it. Um, and, and even something even more basic. I mean, most drummers, if they don't have uh, additional little accessories, as you mentioned, most drummers will have an arsenal of snare drums that they interchange. And that's that's a real, you know, strong, obviously, backbeat of your sound is the snare drum. And, uh, 
you know, Pearl, we have well over a hundred different snare drums that we offer just to get a little versatility in your sound that you can interchange depending on the gig, the venue, et cetera. And so Glenn, you're still actually out there playing. I am. I am. Um, I've been very fortunate. Uh, I've been here with Pearl, not quite as long as Mark, but you know, mid nineties, Mark has got maybe another five to 10 years uh, ahead of me on that, but we've been working together a long time. Um, but yeah, since the beginning and the inception, um, uh, I, I was able to juggle um, and, you know, Music City has been very, uh, very good to me. And I've been able to juggle both uh, playing and, and, and studio recording as well as the business side of Pearl. And uh, more so now, you know, we're able to do everything. I, I have my office in my backpack and I can just go right. wherever and uh, so cool. make it happen. It's and one of, Jeff, it's one of the wonderful things at Pearl, I will say, with the thing, like I said, I, I think I mentioned I'm on my 30th year, next next June will be 30 with Pearl, so I've been through through quite a few decades. But I feel like we should have a moment been, of but, silence here or something. I, mean, geez, <laughs> that is, that I look so old. I, I, but, I mean, uh, you're killing it, 30 years of doing anything, that's awesome, love that. <laughs> that's right. But, you know, I, the, the company has always been so cool that way where we're, uh, you know, all these com companies say, oh, we're kind of family. You know, everybody has that, we're family and we're great. Sure. But Pearl truly is, we have longevity in our employees, as you can see from me, and there's a lot of me there. There's people that have been there for 20. I mean, not just a few, a lot of people. Right. And the company has always been very willing to let you express your, on your playing side, you know, like Glenn in his position, he's on the road right now. We can tell you a little bit about it with Rodney Crowell and all of us, you know, our, the president of our company was a guitar player and he's, you know, every, everybody, the guys in the warehouse have projects going and they've been real so cool, cool with letting us all, all, you know, continue that. Not just, you know, we're at work now and we got to do this. It's been, the company is cool that way. Well, and, and when you talk about, you know, staying in tune, like, there's a stupid little pun, right? Um, you know, within your industry and, and being a musician and playing, I, I, it does give you that, that passion that you can take with you from a gig on a Friday night, you know, into the office on a Monday to talk about it and, and kind of keeping you out there. I mean, I, I think that's, I think that is great that, and to hear that about um, any manufacturer that's out there in the industry and to hear the truth behind that and, and actually understand it and, and know that that's something that they believe in. I, I think that that, um, that that's something I think drummers out there would appreciate, you know, as far as, you know, who they're doing business with, how they're doing business with, Oh yeah. That, you know, and I, so I think there's a neat connection with that. I'm going to ask you a tough question. This will be the toughest question. And I want your honest answer. What was your first drum kit? Now, it, cause I, it, you might say it wasn't Pearl and, and, and you're going to try to pretend it was, but like, what was it? For me, it was, um, it was a Ludwig, uh, classic set that i had a blue sparkle that was my okay. very first drum set yeah do you stay did you do you still have it or did you lose it break i it, don't drop I, it? I, 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 yeah i don't i mean you know we mark will say the same thing we've had so many drums and drum sets come in and out of our lives over the years <laughs> right. you just don't have the room and you're always you know wheeling and dealing and trading and just you know making room for something new and fresh but uh i've i've, I've had some good memories uh with some of my earlier uh, sets that I've had and, and, and percussion instruments for sure. What was what was your first Pearl set? First Pearl set that I still have, um, and that would be the first year that we came out with the Masters line, which okay. Mark has got to be twenty five years now, maybe yeah, uh, somewhere in there. And the Ma the Masters series is that's our iconic professional series of drums that um, is, that that's the benchmark, that's the staple for for Pearl drums is the, is the master series. And then, yeah, we have some customized uh, series that are maybe a little bit above that and some entry level kits below it, but masters is where everything starts. That's awesome. How about you, Mark? What was your first kit? <laughs> well, like I told you, my dad had a little, uh, he had a little Ludwig kit. My brother had a little bit, he was into the rock and roll stuff and he had, a, I think he had a, a Slingerland kit with maybe a seven piece. So I played those kits, but when I got mine, my first one, I remember it very distinctly. I went down to a little local shop, and they had a used Zico's clear plastic. There you Z go. The, na the name of the drum was Zico, Z-I-K-O. So Ludwig had a clear set, but Zico's was like a one of the brand off brands. And man, it was an eight piece. And I thought I was in heaven, man. I had like all the drums in the basement. And I remember. Yeah, your brother only had a seven piece. 
You had an eight. Yeah, piece. Had an like, eight piece. That's like going up to piece. 11. <laughs> That's right. Eight piece. And I remember my, I, you know, I had, I got cymbals with it. My brother had spare cymbals, but I didn't have enough stands. You know, I wanted more, you know, I wanted more stuff. So I didn't have enough stands and he had a pile of cymbals over there. And I was playing in the basement of my house and I hung rope from the rafters and tied a knot and put cymbals on it so I could just play more cymbals. And you actually had to play. And I realized when I hit that thing, it was going to come swinging back at me. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, hit the 16 and kind of dodge it while you're coming back. <laughs> Do you have any but, pictures of that setup at all? I, I think I have, I have, I probably have some shots of the kit, but none of the rope. I don't think there's any of the rope. Hanging uh, we ceiling. need to recreate that <laughs> someday. I just want to, I want to see <laughs> Now the last time I saw action. you play I, I saw Mark play once, and that makes a lot of sense because he's very animated with his body movements when he plays, and maybe it's because he's been dodging <laughs> symbols his whole life. <laughs> and, and the dude's a beast. I mean, like, I've got to assume, I mean, I, I, you're probably a fairly uh, loud-ish, hitting hard style yeah. drummer if I'm going to just kind of look yeah. at you and stereotype there's a lot of, there's you. A lot of high, there's a lot of high elbows. <laughs> oh, you're bringing it. That is fantastic. <laughs> So what was, uh, if you were to go back and, uh, Glenn, start us off with this. If you were to go back and say this was one of the most memorable venues or gigs you played that just made you go, yeah, this is, this is me. This is why I wanted to do this. It doesn't have to be in the biggest play. What, what was that spot? What was that gig? What was that venue? It's hard to beat, and Mark actually came out to this show. But it's hard to hard to beat Jazz at Lincoln Center. I would say would be uh, number one in my book. Just the, the the quality of the venue, the scenery, the backdrop, um, you know, the way that the acoustics are set up. Um, but Jazz at Lincoln Center in Midtown Manhattan, I got to say, is the one to beat for me. I love that, wow. and and it's it's one of those things where you know I think we all have whether it's in music or whatever it is those moments in time in our life and where we're whether it's a hobby whether it's our career whatever it is there's kind of those moments you kind of think about and go yeah that's that's kind of what makes me who I am and why I'm doing it Mark Mark what was yeah. yours where where well, were you at it was the, in that basement was... dodging those symbols no no um, you know getting back to the story I mean I was a I was an athlete. I had multiple basketball scholarships to go to school. And um, I was playing in bands, local bands, and my fathers knew I was a player. But I had an opportunity to go on the road right out of high school with a country band called Phil Delta and the River Delta Band out of Milwaukee and Chicago. And I told my dad I was going. <laughs> I'm not taking the scholarships. I'm hopping on the bus. Oh, and that man. was quite the experience. But this was this was the one thing, like, as you say, you know, you have your experiences. We were about, I think it was like you know, so long ago, but it was probably a week in or something. And we were doing a tour of the East Coast, like from down from up north down to Florida. And we had all these opening opening acts and things. But we played, we opened up for John Lee Hooker, like in uh, Raleigh. And we were down, I remember, and you know, I was so young to the music business. I really didn't sure. have a lot of, experience to all that stuff but we were downtown raleigh and i had my kit you know the, the buildings we had to do the sound check at like one in the afternoon we were playing at five and then john lee hooker came on at eight or whatever and we were sound checking and i remember setting my kit up and getting mic'd up and it was like noon downtown and i kicked the bit the guy getting you know the guy in the monitors is like give me a little kick drum and i was starting <laughs> to kick the bass drum and he pops the sound through this massive pa and I just heard it like echoing off the buildings, like pow, boom. And I I sat there going like, oh man, this is that gonna is be cool. like the funnest thing <laughs> on the planet tonight to play. Cause all I have to do is reach up and hit a tom, and it's just like thunder going off, you know? And sure That's enough, so cool. that was like the first experience I had with a massive PA system in a downtown kind of festival thing. And sure enough, I got up there and, you know, playing that drum set with that kind of power just just threw me into a tailspin. Just, like, it just sealed the deal. It's, it's just like this is uh, I made the right decision. Cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll add one more that just came to me, which was uh, back in the late 90s. And I was on tour um, with Laurie White um, and 
she had a string of top tens back then. And we did a, it was a, it was a country festival in Dauphin, Manitoba, Canada, and like the, almost to the Northern territory of okay. Manitoba. And we drove, it was a series of flights and buses. And by the time we got on this, like one lane highway to go into where we're going, it was just nothing for miles and miles in this northern part of Manitoba. And then they're just on the horizon, you start to see this little blip. And then uh, I remember seeing like RV campers with people coming around for miles and miles. And there was this festival that was going on. And just in the middle of nowhere, in the northern part of Dauphin, Manitoba, Canada, was this cool out of the rocks amphitheater. And um, Vince Gill, I remember, was on the hit. And uh, we were doing, um, it, was, it was a festival, but it was so cool. And you look around and there's nothing for miles, just nothing for miles. And we finished our show and I'm going, wow, why am I just, I'm so tired right now. The sun hasn't even set yet. It was like 11 at night, you know, yep. and it was just like, that's how far north you were. Yep. Uh, but I remember that being a very cool memory. That's, that see, and, and that's, that's what the, I mean, because the two of you have played the worst of places and the best of places. Yeah. And, and sometimes, you know, I, I didn't want to bring up the worst venue because obviously you don't want to talk shit about. Oh, that was last Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like, I'll name the place. It was awful. <laughs> <I can tell. laughs> the beer was flat. It was nothing was good about it. <laughs> so, so as, as we kind of get into the world of Pearl, right. Um, you know, and Glenn, you talk about kind of getting in that education world. There, maybe a lot of people know this, but maybe not. Pearl is huge, huge into the education side and 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 band side of of percussion to the point where That's I right. mean it's a big percentage of your business. And internally, so what, we we say we're an education company. We really do internally. Uh, you know, out facing to the consumer when you say Pearl, you think of rock and roll drum sets. Yeah, right. But exactly. When, when when you really get down to it and you start looking at the spreadsheets, we're an education company and uh, that that's really important for us. What do you think, why? Like, what do you think made you guys so strong in that category of business? So and, and at this point, so very focused into that and, and passionate about being there. You know, I mean, sometimes businesses end up in niche areas um, and they don't know how, they don't know why, and they don't focus on it. Clearly, you guys have taken that. And to call yourselves an education company, you're passionate and caring, and you love that you are. That's a great question. And it's not the first time that I was asked that. And the 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 best way I can explain it, Jeff, is, you know, Mark could say the same thing. We all started, I would say 99% of every drummer out there had a band teacher. And yep. it was typically in, in, in school, whether it was elementary, junior high or high school, you had a band director or a band teacher. And that was most likely your greatest influence, um, you know, to start your career and your journey and, and, and learning, you know, by basic paradiddles from Barth Bennett and McMillan Junior High in Miami, Florida. I'll never forget it. And what sticks to buy and what was the snare drum that I was playing and what was the drum set that was there or the bell kit and all those things stuck with me. And that's what carried me through, you know, even up until college are those brands, the quality of the instruments, the education that I got from my first right. teacher. And uh, yeah, it, it was a, a, a huge influence. And because of that, we treat, you know, band directors on the same level as we treat our A-list combo drumming artists out there uh, yeah. a, a band director has just as much influence in our eyes as um any of the big artists that you would see in our catalog is playing drum sets well and, and, we and in some seriously. cases to your, in some cases to your point that band director actually has a lot more influence because they're teaching so many students year over year exactly. over year so i mean and and obviously you know you've got your own memory of of those people in your life and through your life and that matters. And I think it's, I, number one, I think it's, you know, brilliant in a way that I don't think you guys intentionally meant it that way. Um, but to respect, you know, and and care about that, um, that part of the industry, because so much of that, um, so much of that part of the industry is, is not the glamorous part. Um, you right. know, yeah, maybe they get the halftime show of a big bowl game or something like that, or, you know, a pep band and, you know, at the final four or something like that. But other than that, 
you know, it, it, it creates the vibe, it creates the hype, but it doesn't necessarily get the notoriety at the high school or the, or the college university. So I, I love that you guys look at it the way you do. I think that's, it's the right way to look at it. And I, you know, Hopefully, people are listening to that, this, and you know what? Yeah, you, know. you know what locked us into it too, Jeff. I mean, you guys are talking about, and Glenn is correct. You're talking about the passionate side of all of us starting yeah. with a teacher. But the other thing, from a product standpoint, and I, when I started in '91 with Pearl, we just launched, I believe, and I'm going to be bad on the year, but I think it was around '93. We launched our free flow. Nobody's marching. been around long enough, Mark, to question you on that. You're fine. <laughs> There'll there's be no one fa- out there. There's yeah. no fact checking to be done here. <laughs> but we launched our free floating marching snare drum, which yeah. absolutely lit the marching world on fire, man. I mean, it was it was this show because everybody started to go from the mylar head to the um, Kevlar, you know, that real clackety clack tighten. You had to tighten, and it was crushing normal shells like a re- regular drum shell that had to take the okay. pressure. They were tightening them so hard because they wanted to hear the articulation on the field that those shells were actually crushing. So we came up with oh, a okay. free floating drum with a an aluminum ring uh, at the top, like an aircraft aluminum ring that was supporting itself and the shell was under there taking no pressure. So you could take these Kevlar heads and you could just literally crank them like with a, and you wouldn't break the thing. And you could really get the, and that was that was the launch of the marching scene, and we that thing took off like, a, and everybody was playing that free floater. I mean, I it, remember it, that it revolutionized the the marching industry. It's hard to think of these like big monumental steps with right. something that's so simple as a as a cylinder with a couple of heads on it, but that was a big leap. Um, just just technologically speaking, it doesn't seem like lot, a lot, but yeah, everything changed with that. Um, how orchestrations were written for drumming for in the marching activity um, just because you can do so much more now as mark was saying with just the articulations and the sound changed that was the other thing it's like the 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 i remember when i was uh in in junior high school you did not have that tension so the, the overall pitch and timbre of the instruments were just a lot fundamentally lower and now all of a sudden you can crank it up to tabletop tensions and get sticking techniques that you would never be able to capture on a lower tension drum so everything changed with that and it was the it was the the reasoning behind that is dci drum corps international which is an internet i mean it's a big deal and back in the night it still is a big deal but back in the 90s and early 2000s this was major i mean pbs did you know documentaries on it and i think the thing was even filmed and played on pbs every year but Um, What the judges needed to do in these football stadiums for these competitions is they needed to hear, you know how a big marching drum sounds kind of like, well, they, they want, they can't see if someone's playing clean or missing a note when it's like that. So when you crank up the tensions on these Kevlars, it's now, and you hear every stroke of the drum. So now the judges that are judging these lines and these DCI sure. competitions can hear every mistake. And they started, you know, they had their little walkie talkies back then. And they were, you know, talking about, and it, it changed the whole, the way they judged um, DCI competitions. And we were at the forefront with that drum and everybody kind of, you know, fell in behind it with uh, similar type products back then. So with, with his popular and, and, uh, you know, as as known now as like drum lines are, you know, it's it's like that that cool hip, like you know, everybody kind of loves that drum line when they come out and do their thing. When did that kind of start? It, did that help kind of elevate the whole concept of drum lines just because it was so specific in sound, so like just just almost just pierces you as as somebody that's watching and listening? Is that kind of what? took drum lines to a whole nother place? I, I would say so. Also, that it's treated as an athletic activity as well. Right. So it's not right. just playing drums, you know, uh, on your uh, sitting with a practice pad on your, in your room or right. something. There's a lot of movement and a lot of physical exertion that they've done studies where, you know, maybe you're, you're not able to play uh, uh, football or basketball at the collegiate level, but you can get into a drum line and play and say, hey, look, I'm putting out as much effort on the field as, uh, you know, during the breaks or half times as 
some of my, uh, you know, football playing counterparts here. And right. it's, it's completely accurate. They might not be taking the hits necessarily, but uh, as I far mean, as the, it sounds uh, the, safer the heart it's rate not, is up there. Yeah, it sounds safer. And it sounds like I could probably continue eating as much pizza as I do if I just join a drum line right now. <laughs> I'm thinking that, yeah, that, right, might be right. the, that might be the smart play for me. I'll learn that 60 seconds how to be a drummer from you, Glenn, and then I'll get into that drum line and start right. just putting more pizzas down. I can do that. And, and then I, drum, I, line, drum line, the movie, really. Yeah. Right. And we, we, were the, we were the drums of that movie. We, we, right. we sponsored the drums. And I, I once again, I'm a, you know, it's freaking years, but that had to be late 90s or something, the drum yeah. line the movie. Yeah. Yeah. And that really exploded that whole thing, you know, and then, then, then when you get into pop culture like that, now there's a movie on the big screen with yep. this marching band and this kid. And now artists are starting to put, you know, the, that mix behind their music and, and, and they mix it in now all the time. You see it all the time. And the, yeah. and the two different, you know, uh, versions of that is that you have the very proper DCI activity which mark is saying that you know any little mistake is amplified because of these drums and then you have a little bit more of the show style the the hsbu you know uh, uh show bands that you see and like the honda classic which is what the drumline movie was based upon right that is where everybody stays in their seats at the halftime shows you know yep. I, I go to the titans games every time and when when the tsu marching band comes out no one takes a break everyone right. wants to see all of the movements and the flips and all the crazy uh, uh, things on the field that they're doing. So there, there's two parts of that, but um, it's cool. I mean, uh, when you look at that, you're it going, is. okay, cool. you know, these aren't geeks. These are, these right. are cool folks out there, you know? Yeah. Even if they're geeks, they're cool geeks. Yeah, you know, it's, it's just cool. like, Hey, yeah. it's all right. Um, yeah. Have you ever gone, you know, we've all kind of walked through the cities and you see street performers out there and everything. And you see, you know, the, on the percussion side, you see the five gallon buckets upside down and they're hitting just about anything and they're killing it. I mean, and they sound like legit, fantastic, whatever they, however they figured out how to do that. Have you ever walked by some of those street performers and just gone, man, I just want to give that dude a kit because I want to see what he can do. Like, it's just like, I want to see him behind a legit like drum kit and just say, here here's just go I, I i i do that all the time and i i'm not a drummer i but i look at him like if they can do that with two yeah. three five gallon empty buckets what could they possibly be doing if they if they had the right tools to do something with and yeah. it's i'd love i'd love to do that someday i want to do a documentary and, and just go out to street performers and say and pull up this kit and just say here jump on this and see what's up and see what happens we, we, we've we've actually developed a lot of of you know very portable um, drum and percussion instruments that a lot of these uh, buskers can take out yeah. on the sidewalks and the and the subways and uh, yeah you'd be impressed um, not, you know with what they can do with so little but the creativity I love it it's not just the buckets too oh, I've seen guys with you know literally oh pots and pans and different effects and it's yeah. it's it's really remarkable. Yeah, I the old that. man on the set here, you know, me, the old man on the set, I just saw something on TikTok a couple days ago. TikTok, believe it or not. Yeah, I, I, I'm doing that TikTok. I can lose three <laughs> hours of my life in TikTok one night. <laughs> and there was there was the same, you know, you flip through. I'm them, fancy like that. Somewhere, <laughs> so, somewhere there was a kid playing, like Glenn said, it wasn't even buckets, man. It was like some stuff laying on the ground. Blew my mind, man. Yeah, he was, he was unbelievable. It's so crazy. So, from that, like, what's next for Pearl, though? I mean, you're not going to go to five gallon buckets and go that far, that far backwards. But where, where is Pearl going, and and how much more difficult is it to continue to advance, um, in, in your world with with as far as you are already? Like, what's next? You know, every year uh, when we have a new product release, we you know you don't realize it as you're developing. Uh, the 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 next best thing you know maybe two to three years in advance and you don't even think about it you're going how do we keep coming up with new stuff yes i mean we're how? talking about round cylinders here that's yeah. as you know primal as it comes with musical instruments yet every year there's something that we go wow that's kind of cool i just took it to the next level and even like the, the the master's drum set that you look at now versus the one that i have in storage yeah at its basic heart it's the same shell 
but all of the little trimmings and all the little you know advances that you could do with the hardware and, and you just yeah. the sound it, it's um it's there's small baby steps but when you look at it over a period of time uh it's hard to answer your question specifically jeff but but we just try to make advancements on what we currently have and just try to continue to improve and make it better and then yeah every now and again you go with that light bulb moment of like nobody's thought of this thing yet and let's come out with this cool new uh little accessory so it's um I don't know. I don't think we've we've reached a a plateau necessarily. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it there's there's small little incremental advancements that we're yeah. always improving upon and coming out with that I, I think is just the next thing on the next frontier. Well, and, and to be a manufacturer that you know because you could sit back and just keep on churning them out with in a different color, in a different right. finish, you know, and you could be that, you know, you know, you, you look at car manufacturers out there and most 90% of what they're putting out there is the same stuff year over year, same body style, just new color and, you know, you know, heated leather seats. Um, but uh, I love the fact that, you know, you guys are focused on the details and trying to find what is the next small, no matter how small that might be, you're not yeah. going to sit back and say, uh, we nailed it. We're done, you know, and here's now it's in blue speckle um right. you know you're you're continuing to work with it so mark what what have you seen you know a, as far as some of the things that have been really fun for you you know in, in the pearl line and and what you've kind of you know really enjoyed well, i think like glenn, selling yeah like glenn was saying i mean we're one of the lines that we have that really kind of is inspirational to all the development that moves forward is our masterworks line yeah and basically in Masterworks, we've had it, how long have we had it now, Glenn? That's been man, 20 years. Yeah, a good 20 yeah. years. But basically a Masterworks is a custom shop. And you can, you know, you're talking about, you pick the woods you want, you pick the depths you want, you pick the thicknesses of the woods you want, how many plies, what kind of hardware. So when artists and people start putting these things together, we get ideas from that you know sure. certain certain they they start throwing some crazy stuff down and, and you got you got to lay down some serious bread for a masterworks kit but right you know you're taking a chance that it's going to be your kind of recipe that's going to make you and a lot of the artists do it and then we figure out you know where we're going to go with woods and depths and thicknesses and how it changes and makes things sound so that that line right there for us you know just with orders that we get is creative right. and then inside like glenn said you know our team inside we have we just have great people great players and creative people that are constantly trying to look at old things and new things and blend them you know because there's a lot of stuff from the past that you forget about yeah the pedals and little technology things within hardware and stuff like that and all of a sudden you'll stumble upon something from 1940 or something you go like look at that man it was right. a you know, it's a connection to a pedal that kind of had this and they start yeah. working on it and they obviously modernize it to today's specs and everything, but it turns out to be something really, really that's, cool. That's a good point. Mark just brought up a good point. Probably bass drum pedals and hardware are, um, you know, instances where you can see some pretty dramatic leaps as far as uh, technological advancements. You know, uh, we all started out on, and this is no disrespecting the Ludwig Speed King pedal, but every drummer starts out in our age group with the Ludwig Speed King pedal. Sure. And uh, when you look at, and it, they still, um, with, with a lot of, uh, you know, I give a lot of credit to Ludwig, they still have the Ludwig Speed King in their, in their lineup sure. to this day. And that's something that goes back, you know, before I was born. Yeah. Um, and you look at the pedal advancements that that's, that's happened uh, since then. And at the time when the Ludwig Speed King came out, that was it. Yeah, right. And now you look at so many, I mean, we're, we're concentrating on ninja bearings, which is what skateboarders use in their wheels and direct drive pedals and all of the different spring mechanisms. And just, you know, it's all done with our, you know, our, our R&D team in Japan. And it's like a CAD drawing that you would see right. automotive parts done. And, and the tolerances um, that, that you're able to come up with now, it, it can be a game changer. Absolutely. And, and a pedal is a very good example of um, if, if you can't get a, the, the right action on a bass drum pedal um, out of the gate for a novice player, that can turn you off to play. Yeah. So, so those types of advancements um, is something that we're always going to be looking at to how do we make it easier 
um, for not only a touring professional, but a beginner and a novice player to gravitate towards staying with it and, and going, okay, this is now taking my playing to the next level, or it just feels a lot better for me to play my instrument now because Pearl just made it easier for me. So um, those are two good you know, instances to call out as hardware and, and drum pedals specifically. Well, that's awesome. Guys, thanks for taking the time to be, uh, to be on the show today and kind of share your, your past, your, your, you know, some further back pasts uh, than others, but, uh, but also, also where things oh. are going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Drum, drum roll, please. Um, but thanks so much. It's been, it's been fun getting to know you guys a little bit better through this, uh, through the show and, and uh, certainly love the passion that you guys, you know, bring to not only, uh, you know, Pearl, but also just to the industry by itself, because, uh, you know, like I said, drummers are always the ones that are out there, you know, doing all the work. Let's call it, you're doing all the work, but you still uh, have the biggest smiles on the stage. So I appreciate you guys being part of it. This was the Interstate of Music podcast with Pearl Drums, Glenn Caruba, Mark Derrick. Thanks for being part of it. Peterson out.